Okay. So, throughout the course you have noticed that uh, for some time we discuss uh, methods and then after getting saturated with methods, uh, then uh, one day we say that now we go into problems. The way um, we went into problems here, when we said that now we have done quite a bit of unconstrained optimization, now we will take up some problems. And then specialized methods to solve those specialized kind of problems we discuss. And after exhausting that, we again come back to methods and continue. And then after coming to a point with theory and methods, then we talk about specialized problems, special classes of problems. Like that, we came to linear programming and quadratic programming problems. And we discussed special methods to solve these special problems. In between, on the way, we also handled uh, the special issues with convex programming problems in general. Now, after that, through these four topics, we studied general methods or to an extent general methods, because some of the methods have some limitations for solving constrained optimization problems in general. And now again, we have done enough in that and now we go again to some problems and corresponding special solutions. And make note that till this point, we have actually covered the general scheme of optimization theory, which is sort of necessary in this course. And beyond that, we will now discuss miscellaneous methods and therefore, those miscellaneous methods will come in the context of miscellaneous special kinds of problems. So, the first one is branch and bound method and that comes in the context of a particular kind of problems. So, till now we have sort of specialized or I would say we have sort of generalized in the kind of problems where we have a bunch of real variables perhaps with some constraints and the function that we try to minimize is a real function of these real variables. In that we demarcated the domain with the help of equality and inequality constraints. So, this is the general scheme of problem definition on which till now we have worked. There are many situations where the problem may not be um, amenable to this kind of description. For example, when you are minimizing a structure and in that you have got several things, you are minimizing perhaps cost and uh, satisfying some constraints related to strength and uh, uh, stiffness and other things. And uh, one of the variables is how many pillars to use to support and how many pillars this if it is a variable, then it is not a uh, continuous variable the kind of variables which we have dealt with till now. That means, you cannot do calculus with it. So, all these gradients and continuous variations and all these things uh, will not work. Not only number of uh, pillars, it may be that you know uh, that in uh, mechanical couplings at the end of one shaft you have one flange like this and at the, uh, the at the end of the other shaft you have another flange like this and both of them you connect and then tighten them with 6 bolts or 8 bolts or 12 bolts. Now, you may also have to design you may also have to decide as part of the design how many bolts to put and there you cannot say 17.3 bolts right or 5.4 bolts so you may have to decide out of 6 8 12 something 
So, these may be discrete, it may be integer or it may not be even integer for that matter all the integers may not be valid for example, uh, 7 volts you may not like to put or 5 volts you may not like to put you will put either 4 or 6 or 8 or 12 or something like that right. And sometimes it may be that the numbers which are allowed are not necessarily integers for example, one value may be 2.4 and the next possibility may be 5.22 and the next possibility bigger size may be 9.78, but these values are discrete okay. and therefore, even in this case calculus will not work. Not only calculus will not work, continuous distribution will not work. So, anything above that 5.22 will be 9.78 in between there is nothing. So, in such situations and the problem will become uh, very awkward if you have otherwise a perfectly all right real variable problem with 20 variables all of them real except one or except two of them. Because of that one or two your nice beautiful calculus based methods which are efficient which are fast and which you have understood very well for which you have already developed the code say that they do not work. Because there is one variable which is the uh, index that is one of the discrete numbers. So, in such situations branch and bound method comes to your rescue and it does the job very neatly all your earlier codes all your earlier methods you can use with a little clever arrangement. So, where does it help branch and bound method from whatever I have told till now you would make out that it helps to accommodate a small number of discrete variables in an otherwise continuous optimization problem. Okay. Say one discrete variable or two of them or at most say three of them if more variables are discrete then it will not be great fun to use branch and bound method you will notice why. So, if all or too many variables are discrete may be integer or may not be integer, but discrete values then the problem falls in the categories of integer programming problem and combinatorial optimization, which in themselves are very interesting colorful areas of study and actually very popular areas of study. For example, many people who do not know much optimization, but the moment you talk about optimization and the moment you say that you are studying optimization they immediately jump and say that oh, so you are studying traveling salesman problem is it. But in our entire course we are not uh, studying traveling salesman problem. Okay. So, these uh, traveling salesman problem is a famous combinatorial optimization problem. Okay. In fact, to the extent that it became so famous that many other problems people tried to recast as the traveling salesman problem and then started discussing those problems in a, a sort of familiar uh, setup. To them traveling salesman problem is a familiar setup. Anyway, so the kind of problems that we are talking about for solving with the help of branch and bound method is this. Consider the problem minimize f x subject to whatever ordinary kind of constraints we talk about equality and inequality and one extra constraint that is x 7 say one of the variables has to belong to this discrete set there is an additional headache. Okay. So, how to handle this headache? So, the branch and bound method operates like this first solve the problem in the usual manner disregarding this headache you do not have this headache to begin with take the rest of the constraints and solve it fine. Now, after you have got the solution x star which satisfies all the constraints and among such feasible solutions it is the minimum of this. Okay. Now, in that solution x star check the seventh variable x 7. Okay. So, now x 7 star suppose if it is it if it happens to be one of these just that almost exactly then you are done. Okay. Typically that will not happen. So, suppose 
it falls between two of these values okay. say larger than d 5 and d smaller than d 6. Well, I am assuming that these are organized in ascending order. So, in that context this makes perfect sense. Okay. So, x 7 variable falls in between d 5 and d 6 larger than d 5 smaller than d 6. Now, you say now what to do. So, quickly you might say ok sir then evaluate the solution evaluate the solution keeping all the other variables constant all the variables same as x star, but the this x 7 variable you put this value and this value and uh, evaluate the two functions whichever is lower select that that also branches, but that is not the idea. Because if the function is nonlinear, then this change from the current value of x 7 star to d 5 or to d 6 may change the function profile in such a manner that the other variables affect the function in quite a different manner than earlier. So, then um, you may actually be able to get a better deal. Okay. In fact, if you do not want to keep x 7 at the current x star value, if you want to change then compared to d 5 value you might get a much better function value for some d 3 d uh, x 7 value which is even less than d 3 or less than d 2 it is possible. Okay. So, if you exclude this particular value of x 7 then perhaps a completely different value may be better with corresponding differences in the other variables. So, the branch and bound method says that after noticing this debacle branch the problem into two problems with one extra bound still keeping it in the regime of continuous variables. You say that now we define a problem minimize f x subject to h x equal to 0 g x equal oh, oh, this should be g x less than equal to 0 okay, g x less than equal to 0 not g x equal to 0 g x less than equal to 0. And uh, then of course, this you are not including, but you include one more additional constraint which is a bound constraint. In this case in one case in one branch you include x 7 less than equal to d 5 in the other branch you include x 7 greater than equal to d 6. Okay. So, that means these two lines g x less than equal to 0 and this one you consider as the nonlinear optimization problem constraint optimization problem solve that. In the other branch these two lines and this okay. out of these two if you find that in one case you have got a discrete value for this. For example, chances are high that when you solve this you might find that x 7 star turns out to be d 5 because that much is allowed on the upper side. Okay. In this branch you might find that in the solution x 7 star appears as d 6. If one of these two things happen or some other value d 2, d 3 or d 8 or d 7 just appears miraculously of course, it is unlikely to appear then you have got your solution. Otherwise, if a similar situation recurs for example, as x 7 now if you get some value which is between d 3 and d 4 then you repeat this process finally, somewhere you will settle. Okay. So, when you get a solution x star in which x 7 happens to be one of these 8 as interior value it is unlikely to happen as a boundary value like this coming from one of the branch constraints bound constraints it is more likely to happen then you have to accept it that is among the x star solutions till now whichever gives f x lowest. Okay. So, this is branch and bound method and the same thing you can continue doing if there are say more than one such discrete variables. For example, in this case what we did 
was that for x 7 we had these numbers d 1, d 2, d 3, d 4, d 5, d 6, d 7, d 8 like this. So, first round if the solution came here we did not accept it we made two branches in one branch we were ready to go till this point and in the other branch we were ready to come to this point this much was gap which was not covered in either of the two branches. Okay. And after that if d 5 appeared as x 7 in the x star solution then we accepted it otherwise if it came somewhere here, here then again we would similarly branch like this, like this and solve on this side and on this side right and so on. Now, suppose there are two such variables which are discrete in nature, then also you can do branch and bound say x 7 is one variable which is discrete and uh, say x 13 is another variable which is also discrete. x 7 and uh, x 13. Say x 7 can take these 8 values d 1, d 2, d 3, d 4, d 5, d 6, d 7, d 8 and x 13 can take these 6 possible values e 1, e 2, e 3, e 4, e 5, e 6. So, now what happens is that first time when you solve the problem without considering these discreteness issues, then suppose you get an x star from which when you scoop out x 7 and x 13, you find that in the x 7 x 13 space it falls here. Okay. This is the first x star that you get. Now, think of this this. Okay. Now, this is nowhere, so you have to find it somewhere. Okay. So, x 7 falls between d 6 and d 7. So, you say that this side is okay, this side is okay, fine. And what about x 13? x 13 falls between e 4 and e 5. So, you would say this side is okay. and this side is okay. That means, this part that is yeah above E 5 and left of D 6 this side this quadrant is fine. Similarly, this quadrant is fine. Similarly, this quadrant will be fine and this quadrant will be fine. In between this much will be left that means, this time you will branch the problem original problem into 4 branches. Okay. 
in one case you will use the bounds x 7 less than equal to d 6 x 13 less than equal to e 4. In the second case that is this this branch. Okay. In the second case you will say x 7 still less than d 6 and x 13 greater than e 4 e 5 okay. that is this branch. Okay. Similarly, you can work out what will be the description of this and this. Okay. So, these four branches you will separately solve. In this case, it will be x 7 greater than d 7 and x 13 greater than e 5, here it will be x 7 greater than d 7 and x 13 less than e 4. Okay. So, those will be the extra constraints in these and the other h x equal to 0, g x less than equal to 0 will be as usual fine. So, this is branch and bound method and now you can figure out if too many variables are discrete then uh, uh, why it will not be a practical method practicable method. Because if four of the variables are discrete in this case then it will be at every round of branching you will have 2 into 2 into 2 into 2 16 branch problems and that will be too much. Okay. So, that is why in general for combinatorial problem as such branch and bound method is not a very good idea. Okay. So, now you can handle those problems also in which uh, the problem entirely falls in the category of nonlinear constraint optimization problem of the kind that we have studied earlier, except that just there is one variable or there are two variables which are spoiling the game by uh, being discrete. So, such problems you can handle with branch and bound method. And now we will discuss a special method which is some sort of a crazy method with a background in a completely different area manufacturing systems okay, and that is simulated annealing method. You know what is annealing? When uh, uh, you want a very tough metal with quite a bit of ductility and a lot of toughness that is energy storage capacity rather than hardness and you want to safeguard against brittleness. Then after you melt the metal you try to cool it at a very slow rate very slow cooling. So, that it is uh, microstructure can become very highly ordered and that is a very low energy uh, kind of microstructure low energy structure. Okay. So, this method is based on that analogy and the most interesting thing in this method is that in this method upward steps are allowed. I am not telling upward steps are taken or upward steps are preferred or any such thing upward steps are allowed. Okay. So, till now all the methods that we have discussed in that we want each step to be downhill and that means these are sort of greedy methods they the moment they find some lower function value they try to run into that direction and sometimes they might run so fast uh, worst example is pure Newton's method uh, that uh, that is not a good thing to do. Okay. So, in comparison to those greedy methods which till now we have discussed simulated annealing is sort of ascetic. Okay. So, once in a while it is ready to take some loss also it is okay. So, there is a chalta hai attitude in simulated annealing, but limited. Okay. So, this is one thing upward steps are allowed under what condi conditions that is allowed we will discuss that. 
this is useful in multimodal or global optimization. For example, in a function landscape, I am drawing the sketch in a single variable function setup, but that can be used for multivariate function also. If this is the function, then if you have this as the starting point, then most methods that we have discussed till now are quite likely to give you this point, okay, because these methods are greedy. But in the case of uh, similar anything, there is a good possibility that you land up here. Okay. So, any normal method any ordinary method that we have discussed till now greedy kind of method. If that goes from here to here and then goes here and here and then once it is trapped in this well, it is almost impossible for that method to come out of it. Okay. On the other hand to al by allowing uphill steps once in a while under some circumstances in fact, quite often in the earlier iterations simulator anything gives you some chance of landing at this place and by adjusting parameters you can get sometimes better values. So, this method is therefore, useful in multimodal or global optimization. There is no guarantee that it will lead you to the global optimal point, but there is a good chance that you will go there and by adjusting the parameters you might be able to reach there quite often. Now, this is applicable in both continuous and combinatorial problems, this is another great advantage. And uh, there are many books, many optimization books which discuss simulator annealing. I had I have found the um, uh, exposition uh, simplest and best in the numerical recipes book. Numerical recipes is actually supposed to be a handbook of uh, numerical programs okay, C, Fortran, Pascal, C++ in those functions programs written for solving numerical analysis problems, but you can actually use that numerical recipes book as numerical, numerical analysis textbooks also. And many methods are very nicely um, explained in that and I have found the explanation and implementation of simulator annealing till now simplest and best in numerical recipes, as I have found in many other numerical analysis topics. Okay. So, as I told you annealing is the manufacturing technique of slow cooling of molten metal leading to highly ordered low energy microstructure. Okay. So, in this crystals are very close to perfect okay. as opposed to quenching which is a thermal process of cooling the molten metal suddenly. Okay. So, cooling the molten, molten metal suddenly is actually easy, because you just put it at a very low temperature and the moment it starts solidifying put it in the water and that is quenching. Okay. So, annealing in comparison requires a lot of headache. So, whatever is the temperature of the molten metal you have to keep it in an environment which is at a slightly lower temperature, so that the cooling is slow. And after the metal has acquired that temperature, you have to keep it under even slightly lower temperature and so on you have to continue all the way. In between some annealing processes also allow reheat, that is after having cooled the molten metal up to say uh, 400, 400 degree Celsius, the, some cooling schedules allow it to be mildly reheated up to 450 degree Celsius and then again cooled. Say take it up to 200 degree Celsius and then again reheat a little to 20 degree Celsius and then again cool. So, this kind of thing is also done. Okay. 
and why it is done? So, that while cooling even at a slower rate if some intermediate um, defects have developed by slight reheating you let you let those defects to release and then when the bonds are reformed then chances are good that this time they will not form with so many defects. And that means, this bond releasing this going to a higher energy state that is possible not only when you are reheating, it is possible even at a particular temperature while otherwise it is cooling then also a particular change may take place which takes it to a higher energy level. We will see how because these physical processes are actually probabilistic. So, for the purpose of function minimization in the annealing process we make certain suitable replacements. Time is replaced by iterations. So, each second may be replaced with one iteration or each half second may be replaced by one iteration. Temperature is replaced by a control parameter which we will control and which will affect the probabilities of new configurations, new feasible solutions getting accepted. Energy will be replaced with the objective function which we want to minimize and permissible configurations in the metal cooling business its analog is the any feasible point feasible solution and the Boltzmann's probability distribution the probability by which an a, a, a new feasible solution is accepted um, at uh, I mean throwing out a, an old solution that probability is given by P e that is for a new solution for a new feasible solution proposed the probability of its acceptance is according to the energy this is the molten metal stuff. Okay. So, that is probability of uh, the energy that is probability of a configuration with energy E is this E to the power minus E by K, K T where E is the energy of that configuration T is the absolute temperature Kelvin temperature and K is the Boltzmann's constant. Okay. So, in our case this E energy will be replaced by the function value because we are trying to minimize the function and that is the analog of energy to be minimized for our purpose. And this Boltzmann's constant K uh, you do not have to put that uh, uh, funny number which you studied in physics books you can put any suitable number in fact you can put one. Okay. Now, what are the requirements for us to be able to use this annealing setup with these appropriate analogs. One requirement is that we have to have a description of the domain. So, that at every iteration we propose a feasible point okay. and if an, an infeasible point if an infeasible solution is proposed that is outright rejected asking for a new point new solution. So, for that a description of the domain should be there. So, that typically we will have next a generator of random change in x and now this is complicated. I will come back to why it is complicated. Now, function evaluation that we anyway have if you are doing any optimization you have a function you have a routine which does the function evaluation for you you do that and hence you can find delta f. Now, at f 1 value of the energy there is some probability at f 2 value of the energy there is another probability and so you can say that changing a configuration with f 1 function value what is the probability of acceptance of another configuration another solution another feasible point with f 2 function value. So, that f 2 minus f 1 you put here in the place of delta f and since it is minus. So, it will be e to the power f 1 minus f 2 okay, 
minus of f 2 minus f 1 divided by k t. Okay. Now, this probability if you try to put some suitable values you will see that if the later point is of uh, higher function value then this will be negative and divided by k t that entire index will be negative e to the power a negative number will give you the value which is less than 1. And if the difference is more then it will be even less even less even less and so on. Okay. So, if you propose a new point which is at a higher function value then also you get a probability of acceptance of this new point. Okay. If the new point that you propose has an extremely high function value then this will be enormously negative and that will mean that e to the power that negative number will be extremely small and there will be very low probability of acceptance of that. Okay. On the other hand if this has only slightly higher than the previous point then also there will be a reasonable amount of probability for acceptance of that right. So, in fact it may be 0.9 probability 0.95 probability that is also possible if there are small differences okay, on the higher side. Think what will happen if the later point that you are proposing is actually better has less function value. In that case f 1 minus f 2 will be positive and then e to the power this by k t will be a number higher than 1 and probability cannot be higher than 1. So, you revise this and say that probability of acceptance of a new point which is giving delta f function value change change in function value will be the lower of these two that is 1 and this out of these whatever is lower. That means, a function value f 2 if it is lower than the current function value f 1 then this will certainly be higher than 1 and that is why 1 will be accepted. That means, a lower function value is always accepted. Okay. On the other hand if you are proposing a point with a higher function value then 1 will not survive in this minimization in the smaller of the two version this guy will survive and then with a probability of 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.87, 0 0.82, 0 0.75, 0 0.6, 0 0.3, 0 0.5 whatever it is that will be accepted. So, with that probability you will accept the new point even though it is slightly worse. Okay. So, accept x 2 with this probability of p of delta f okay. and this temperature you have to decide according to a cooling schedule up to absolute 0. Okay. So, the cooling schedule may be iterations version versus temperature. So, initial temperature high where there is a good possibility of even uphill steps and then for these many iterations perhaps uh, 700 iterations you keep it at that temperature okay. and then you come lower the temperature and then continue for another may be 800 iterations and like this you go on doing that. Okay. So, this you do and at the end wherever you reach or wherever you converge when not much changes take place. Okay. So, there are two important points to keep in mind. One is intermittent, intermittent reheat is also possible in the schedule. The schedule may be like this, like this, like this and then a little reheat and then like this like this a little reheat like this the reheat steps are typically smaller okay and it is also possible that you keep on recording minima on the way and that helps for example if the solution is like this and you are hell bent on finding 
the global optimum, then as I told you in the beginning of the course, beginning of the semester that there is no way other than there is no way to tell that what you have got in hand is the global minimum is the absolute lowest function value other than developing a confidence that you have found all the local minima. Okay. So, or a reasonable number of them so as not to miss the global. Then what you can do? You can keep the cooling schedule very slow and with occasional reheats and then on the way whenever you find that an uphill step is taken say for example, if you start from here and very early you get to this point okay, till that time your cooling schedule has not finished which means that the number of iterations that you budgeted for in the beginning that is not yet over. So, you see it is it works like uh, the uh, what is that uh, method initially that we studied for single variable optimization uh, golden section. Okay. So, like golden section method it budgets for a number of iterations and according to that it proceeds come what may. So, similar handling operates like that. So, by the time you come here quickly your budget of the number of iterations is not exhausted. So, you will reheat or you will continue and take uphill steps quite often and then it may happen that uh, after finding this one round then uh, you might uh, make some changes and then uh, come here and then get this minimum also. So, the moment you find that till now a minimum you have got okay, then uh, save it. Okay. So, till now minima, till now minima, till now minima if you keep on saving it then if you on the way if you see many minima which come on the way and among them this also appears okay, may be this appeared as the fourth minima. Okay. So, and after which this also appeared like this then among the minima that you have saved on the way this will be the smallest this will be the lowest function value that you saved and from there you can pick up that till now whatever minima on the way we noticed this turned out to be the smallest. Okay. So, this is how you can use it for global optimization. Okay. So, after this uh, at uh, the later uh, lectures we will discuss some other methods also of a multimodal or global optimization. Okay. So, that we will discuss in the later lectures. Okay.